Well, John 5, and looking at the first 18 verses, although I would encourage you later on to go and read the rest of the chapter yourself, because uh, the rest of the chapter is really Jesus' teaching that arises out of this incident. And so it's all related, and it backs up exactly what I'm showing you in this sermon. We're looking at these signs in John's Gospel. The signs which show to us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And when we believe in him, therefore, we will have life in his name. That's the purpose of all these signs. It's to show you the identity of Jesus and to show you that you can have faith in him and therefore have eternal life. This is the third sign. Um, And we find it here that Jesus is now in Jerusalem. He's gone up for one of the feasts. There were various feasts in the Jewish calendar, and it was required that the Jewish men would go up to Jerusalem for these feasts. And Jesus, being dutiful, he goes up. And he comes to this place uh, by the Sheep Gate of Jerusalem, where there's a pool called Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy or house of grace. And up in Stornoway, there was a a Christian-run hospice and nursing home, which was called Bethesda, for this very reason. It's a house of mercy. Uh, The people there wanted to to give mercy from a Christian perspective to those suffering, uh, to those who are uh, older, but also to those particularly uh, who have cancer. That, uh, this pool is called Bethesda, a house of mercy. And and John describes it here for us that there were five roofed colonnades. Uh, Colonnades are are rows of columns. And uh, you would have these columns and then a roof on top of them so that it would protect uh, you from rain. But you could walk up and down uh, these colonnades. Now, it's says here uh, there, were, there were five of these. So you're trying to imagine in your head, what would that look like? Five roofed colonnades. And, and maybe you, you jump immediately to the idea of a pentagon, fa- a five-sided shape. For a long time, people looked at this and thought, you would never have a, a pentagonal shape. And certainly in Jerusalem, there's no evidence of any uh, pentagonal uh, shape such as this. Therefore, the Bible must be wrong, isn't it? Isn't that the way it is? When we can't understand something, we can't picture it, we jump to that conclusion. The Bible must be wrong. But what do you think, friends? Archaeologists, what do they find? They find it exactly the way it's to be. It's not a pentagon. It's a four-sided shape, but one uh, colonnade going down the middle, uh, dividing the pool uh, really into two. Five roofed colonnades exactly as John describes here. We we saw that recently when we looked at Acts 17, uh, with the inscription about the particular word that looked used, and I drew that to your attention, uh, that the Bible is always true, and it's always accurate, even if you can't see it uh, at first glance. Um, This pool was probably used for cleansing, ceremonial cleansing. There were various rules in the Old Testament about when you had to wash to make yourself clean before the Lord. But in Jesus' day, it had really become like a a hospital or a hospice, a place where these invalids are lying around in a great multitude. Uh, They're protected from uh, rain up above, uh, but air can flow through uh, the sides, through the columns. And imagine this scene as you see it there in verse 3. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now, for most of you here, you're pretty healthy. But if you ever have to go to a hospital, and you're trying to find the person you're looking for to visit them, maybe you're like me, you look up and down, side to side, through all the rooms, until you find the person you're looking for. And so often are you not struck by just how miserable people look in the hospital, how poor they are, how sick they are, that you look around you and you see uh, that people are suffering, they're in agony, they're in pain, they look wretched, and you realize 
just how much you've been taking your health for granted. Go to a hospital and you see these things. Perhaps some of you uh, are in hospitals more regularly and you take note of these things. This is a sad sight, desperately sad, to see all these invalids. Various problems, blind, lame, paralyzed. But they're all suffering and they're all in misery. But particularly, we'll see there's one man. Zoom in, as we see here. John zooms in on the one man, verse 5. One who had been an invalid for 38 years. Can you imagine that? 38 years. That's probably most of his lifetime. When you consider that in the ancient world, life expectancy was not particularly high. And so this man... It has spent the vast majority of the days he will have paralyzed, lame, lying beside this pool, hoping somehow that he can be made better. Why were these people gathered here? Well, they were gathered because they were hoping for healing. Isn't that the only possible reason why they would all come? You see, the waters would be stirred up And various of the ancient texts of the Bible, there are various texts, but some of them mention the fact that an angel would come down from heaven and stir up these waters. And the first person who would get into the water would be healed. And so all these invalids are lying around this pool, waiting for that event, which didn't come frequently, longing for it. And then when the waters were stirred, they were hoping to be first in. But the multitudes are there and only one can be healed each time. That leaves so many people blind, lame, paralyzed, continuing on in their misery. It's a sad scene. This man who has been ill and an invalid for 38 years is probably some form of a paraplegic We see the the misery of his condition in the fact that he has no one. He'll he'll show it in a few moments to Jesus. He has no one to help him. He can't himself get down in the waters and there's no one to help him. He is so miserable. He is so miserable. And does your heart not go out to him as you consider it? He's in a hopeless condition. But then Jesus comes. Jesus walks up to him. Now, this man has no idea who Jesus is. Even later when Jesus has healed him, he still has no idea who Jesus is. But Jesus sees him there, verse 6, and he knew that he had been there for a long time. For some reason, Jesus knows. Because he is God, Jesus knows. He knows this man intimately, and he knows how long he has sat there in this terrible condition. And he looks at him and he says, do you want to be healed? What a strange question. Preposterous, isn't it? Do you want to be healed? Imagine if you were diagnosed with cancer and the doctor said to you, do you want to be healed? Of course you want to be healed. Anytime you're sick, you want to be healed. But here is a man who for 38 years has suffered as an invalid. Perhaps he's grown used to it. This is his life. This is the way things have always been. Perhaps he is despairing. He's lost any hope. There's no chance of him getting into these waters and getting healed. Do you want to be healed? Jesus says, well, perhaps, perhaps not. Perhaps there's just no hope for it. The difficulty, he says there in verse 7, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. You see, at this pool at Bethesda, it was every man for himself. First in is the one that's healed and no one else. There's no mercy in the house of mercy. There's no helping another one to get down before you. You want to get in so that you can be healed and you don't care about the others. That's what happens here. And the sick man here is left hopelessly on his own. He is such an invalid, he can't even beg. He's just there. But Jesus performs a miracle on this day. 
as he commands him, get up, take up your bed, that is probably just a little mattress or a little piece of cloth that he's lying on, take up your bed and walk. Now, if, if the first thing Jesus said to this man was strange, here's something that's even stranger. Go to a paraplegic and say, get up, get out of your wheelchair. Get up and walk. And they would just look at you, wouldn't they? How dare you say something so insensitive? And yet, verse 9 shows us that immediately strength is coming in to this man. He's healed at once. There's no delay. It's not, it's not like Jesus administers medicine and it just takes time for it to work. Immediately he's healed. Immediately he has the power in his legs to stand up, to pick up his bed, and to walk. This is a wonderful miracle that has been performed. People who were there surely must have been astounded. This is something different than we've ever seen before. But again, friends, as we've seen throughout this series, this is no mere miracle. It is a sign. It's pointing us to some truth that we have to grasp. It's not just that we, enough for us to wonder at it, to be amazed at what Jesus has done. We need to see beyond that to who Jesus is, his identity as the Christ, the Son of God. In the first sign, Jesus changed water to wine. And what did that show? It showed that Jesus was able to do a new thing. It showed that Jesus was the Messiah. He can take water and change it to wine. He can take something which is boring and common and make it something new that brings joy and that satisfies Jesus is the Messiah who brings in the new covenant. That's what we saw. In the second sign, the healing of the official son, it shows to us that Jesus is God. Because just as in creation, when God spoke and it was done, so Jesus spoke and this man's son was healed, even though he lived many miles away. Jesus did not have to go and lay hands on him. He spoke and the word of God healed him. Here we see another miracle. But again, friends, it's a sign. It's pointing us to Christ's identity. So what is it particularly that it's showing us? Well, we have to take note of another thing about this event. It tells us there at the end of verse 9 that it was the Sabbath day. Now, that's an important point. Because the Jews, the Pharisees, had added in lots of laws to restrict the Sabbath day and the blessings that it gives. From the beginning of creation uh, in Genesis, we see that we are expected to keep the Sabbath day holy. God made the world in six days and then rested on the seventh day. And by doing that, he sanctified the Sabbath, or we could say he set it apart. It's not to be common it's not a day to do whatever you want to do and what I want to do. It's a day for holy purposes, a day for living for God in particular, for worship and for rest. He makes it very clear in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In it you should do no work, none whatsoever, but we are to rest and to worship. But the problem is that the Pharisees had added into that law lots of new rules. Uh, they, they had, in a sense, put a hedge around the law that, so that they wouldn't transgress it. And they made up rules such as you can't carry uh, heavy loads or you can't carry even as much as a bed. Now, how heavy was this bed that the man's carrying? A, a little mattress, uh, maybe like a roll-up mattress that you would have or a piece of cloth that he's lying on. And yet they're saying you may not carry such a load on the Sabbath because you're breaking the law of God. And that's what they do here. Verse 10, the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Notice what happens here. There's no joy for the man who has been healed. There's no care for him. He's been an invalid for 38 years. There's no wonder 
that this man has been healed. There's no attempt to find out who healed him. There's no attempt to find this miracle worker who could heal heal all the other invalids at Bethesda. All there is is anger that this man has broken one of their man-made laws, one of their traditions. Jesus hasn't broken the law of God. He has broken a man-made tradition which ruins the Sabbath day because the Sabbath is not made, uh, man is not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath is made for man. Did Jesus break the Sabbath day? Well, no. Each of the Ten Commandments was kept perfectly by Jesus. And so too the Fourth Commandment. And Jesus gives his own defense. We see it in verses 16 and 17. This was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working My father, who's his father? He's speaking of God the Father. My father is working until now, and I am working. Has Jesus desecrated the Sabbath? Has he broken it? Has he worked on the Sabbath? Well, he says, my father works on the Sabbath. Because even though God rested on the seventh day, he still engages in works of providence, doesn't he? He upholds the world by the word of his power. He continues in these things. If God took a break from being the God of providence one day in seven, the whole world would collapse and there would be nothing here. But God continues working. And Jesus is saying, as my Father in heaven works, so I work. Notice what he's doing there. He's claiming equality with God. The Jews see it very clearly. Perhaps we, because we are removed from the situation, because we're not from that culture, we can't quite see it. But verse 18 makes it very clear that these Jews, these Pharisees, they see it because this incenses them. They are so angry that they plan to murder Jesus. The anger is in their heart. It's so strong. They want Jesus to die. Jesus, the miracle worker. Jesus, who has ended this man's 38-year misery. Jesus, who heals and can heal others. And yet they want to kill him because their man-made laws, their traditions, have, have been broken. But notice, it's not only because he broke the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God. The Jews see it. This sign that we're studying this evening, the Jews can see the point of it. He is making himself equal with God. Jesus is saying that he is divine, that he is God, equal with the Father. And so they reject him. They want nothing to do with him because in their view, he is breaking their laws. It's a sad fact, isn't it, that some people in this world can see very clearly who Jesus is, and yet they still reject him. They know, they know that he is God. It's been proclaimed to them. They've been brought up learning it. They've had Christian parents and so on, and yet they reject it because there's something about it, something about Jesus they just can't accept. And so they persecute, as these Jews did. But I want us, instead of focusing on these Jews, for the remainder of our time, to think more about this man who's been healed. Because Jesus is not so much concerned about his paralysis. He's more concerned about his spiritual condition. Didn't we see that last week with the official son? He was concerned not so much about the the misery of the son, He he did have compassion on him, but he was more concerned about the nobleman and the fact that his his faith was deficient, and so he takes steps to deal with him. And the same thing is true here. Yes, this man had a 38-year period of misery, but Jesus wants to deal with him and his sin. 
Look at what he says to him in verse 14. Afterward, because Jesus had withdrawn himself, he'd, he'd gone off into the crowd, but afterward, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Look, he's drawing his attention to the miracle. You're now well. In other words, I have healed you. You're well. You can walk. Isn't it a wonderful thing? But don't take it for granted. Learn the lesson from it. Go and sin no more. Perhaps there's a hint here uh, that this man's disease was caused by his sin. Perhaps some sin he had committed many years before has led to this condition. It's not always the case that a particular sin leads to a particular disease. Uh, We're going to see that in one of the future signs in John chapter 9, the man who was born blind. The disciples asked Jesus, was it because of this man's sin that he's born blind, or was it because of his parents' sin? Jesus says, neither. Neither. Don't be so quick to draw lines between cause and effect in these spiritual matters. Don't be so quick, friends, to look at someone's suffering and say, oh, the reason they're suffering is because of this sin. We are not in the place of God to be so quick to draw such lines. But that's not to say that it's never the case that there's a connection. Sin does have consequences. We we can be so slow to learn that. But sin does have consequences. Not just spiritual eternal consequences, but also physical consequences. Uh, The person who sleeps around, for example, can get diseases. We know that. That's an obvious one, but there are lots of examples of that. The person who gives themselves over to anger can get ulcers in their stomach. Things like this, physical consequences because of sin. And perhaps that's the case here with this man. Verse 14, see you are well, sin no more. Or perhaps it's the case that this man who's been paralyzed has been restrained from sin. Because he couldn't get up and walk, he hasn't had the same opportunities to sin as other people had. He doesn't go places that other people go because he's been paralyzed. And Jesus is saying to him, take note, you have been healed, but you need to deal with your spiritual condition. Sin no more. But there's a very serious warning added to it. Look again at verse 14. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. What can be worse than 38 years of paralysis? When I think of various diseases that can come, they're all awful, aren't they? But isn't paralysis one of those things that you really, you just dread? If some disease were to come in, like motor neuron disease, that would so paralyze your body that you can't move, What a terrifying thought to think of not being able uh, to move your limbs. What can be worse than that? Surely Jesus here is insensitive and wrong. And yet there is something worse than paralysis. It's the eternal punishment in hell. It's what the Bible speaks of so clearly. Oh, surely that's Old Testament language, isn't it? That's not something Jesus would speak about. Friends, Jesus speaks more about hell than he speaks about heaven. Such were the warnings that he gave when he was on earth. He wants us to know that there is a literal place where those who are outside of Christ, those who do not believe in him, those who have sinned against him, will be sent to after their death and will be punished forevermore. A place of fire and burning a place of torment, a place of agony, a place of suffering. Why? Because sin brings the judgment of God. Let's not not say, well, this is unfair. Why Why would the Lord send people to such misery? Because we've sinned, every one of us. Not one of us is better than another. We've all sinned and gone astray. No one is righteous. No, not one. But Jesus says here to this man, sin no more lest you end up suffering in a worse way. 
realize that there are eternal consequences to sin. Hell is not a place to go temporarily. It's not like you can go and then get an early release and escape and then go to heaven and all will be okay. Hell is a permanent place for those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, for those who have sinned against the Lord of all the universe. Go and sin no more, lest this worst consequence comes upon you. He's really saying to the man, you need to depart from your sin. You need to turn away from the life you've been living. That is, you need to repent. That's the Bible word for it, repentance. A 180 degree turn. You've been going in this direction. It's a wrong direction. It's a sinful direction. It's a life that is displeasing to God. It's a life of sinning against him. Turn from it. Sin no more and go this way in the way that pleases God. You must be done with sin. You must cut yourself off from it lest something worse happen. You see, Jesus is showing here that this paralysis that the man has had is a picture of sin itself. For 38 years, he's had a miserable existence. But friends, those who are still in their sin, still under the power of sin, do they not have a miserable existence? They're cut off from true joy And peace, as we thought of this morning. This man, for 38 years, couldn't get healed. He couldn't make it to the pool. And so too, for those who are still in their sins, they cannot get themselves healed, no matter how hard they try. There's no one to help them. And so too, for you and for me, no family member can do anything for you to make you saved. No family member can do anything for you that that gets you out of hell. You need for yourself to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin is a helplessness, just as this man was helpless. He could try to get to the pool. He could, and perhaps he had strength in his arms. He could drag himself along if he could get near that pool when it was stirred up. And yet, no matter how hard he tried, he was never healed. Yesterday, when we were coming back from Stornoway, we were on the A9 and we got a flat tire. It's an awful thing to get a flat tire. And, of course, new cars don't have spares. You get those, the foam that you're meant to pump into the tire. And it's a temporary fix, isn't it? It, it, it inflates the tire. Uh, we had three miles to go to get to a garage. And you try your best. You're driving at 30 miles an hour because that's what you have to do. But you're hearing the air coming out of the tire. You know it's not worked. You know you're not going to reach it. Uh, And try as you might. Well, of course, we didn't reach it. We were very close, but not close enough. We couldn't make it. We were cut short. And so it was, and so it is for sinners. Try as you might to get close. Try to do something for yourself to get yourself healed of your sin. Try something to solve this problem in the human heart of sin. And no matter what you try, you'll not manage it. You'll not reach it. But on this day, Jesus spoke to this man. And he said to him, do you want to be healed? Look at that. It's, we, we saw it. It seemed insensitive, didn't it, at the end of verse 6. Do you want to be healed. And friends, I could say the same thing to you today. You have sinned. You have done what's evil in the sight of God. That sin has corrupted your nature as it's corrupted everyone's nature. Do you want to be healed from it? Do you want to be done with sin? This spiritual disease, this plague in the human heart, Do you want to be healed? And do you want Jesus to heal you? Maybe for some of you here today, there are sins that you feel quite attached to. And so maybe the answer is, no, I don't want to be healed. Not yet. Because there's still this thing that I can't let go of. I know that if I become a Christian, 
I'm going to have to let go of that thing, and I'm just not ready to do it. But do you not want to be healed? It's a spiritual disease that is crippling you. You can't go to the Lord in prayer. You can't truly worship him as other people do. And you won't get into heaven as long as you have this disease in your heart. Do you not want to be healed of it? Or maybe it's a case that you think, I'll just try a bit more. If I can just persevere, I'll get there. Just as as we tried yesterday to get to that garage. Just a little bit more and we'll reach it. Friends, you won't reach it, not by yourself. Perhaps you say, well, if I fix these things in my life, X, Y, and Z, if I can get my house in order in these ways, then I'll be in a position to be healed. No, friends, it's the wrong order. First, go to Jesus. Do you want to be healed, he says? Well, tonight is your opportunity to be healed. This sign shows to us that Jesus is, is divine. It shows to us that he is equal with God the Father. The Jews were angry because he made himself out to be equal with God, but this man is healed because Jesus is equal with God. And friends, Jesus is the same today. He is able to heal you of your spiritual diseases. Just as his father has been working until now, so too he continues to work. Do you want to be healed? Well, go to him and confess your need. Confess just how long you've been a spiritual cripple. Confess just how long you've been living in sin. Confess just how devastating sin has been in your life to corrupt you. Confess uh, just how many ways you've tried to reach that pool of healing and you've fallen short. Confess just how impossible it is for you to be healed by yourself. Confess the fact that there is no one to help you get healed but Jesus Christ and him alone. And take confidence in this fact that Jesus is equal with God and therefore he can save you. He can deliver you from all your sin. He can heal all your diseases. And when he does heal you, and for many of you here, you could stand and give a testimony tonight and say you've been healed in this way. Once he does heal you, what are we to do? But go and sin no more. Again, in verse 14. See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. We don't get saved by trying to sin no more. You'll find that you don't have the power for it. You don't have the ability for it. You first go to Jesus and get healed, and then he gives you the power to go and sin no more. He changes you. He helps you to deal with the power of sin in your life. And so having been healed, having been saved, we now commit ourselves to a new way, the new way, a way of walking in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. This man had been an invalid. It was a miserable thing for him. But through it, the Lord Jesus comes and deals with his sin. And friends, perhaps tonight you're here and you hear this and the Lord is intending to deal with you and your heart and your sin. Do you want to be healed. Amen.